So good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for coming to today's session on the Global Health Seminar Series. Uh, while we have more people joining the room, I just want to thank you all uh, very much for joining us today in our very first of the three seminar sessions that we'll be hosting, theme around the new theme of um, AI and big data in global health. So this is part of the Sing Health Duke NUS Global Health Institute uh, Global Health Seminar Series. Uh, and if you would like to learn more about some of the other themes that we have covered thus far, you can watch uh, many of our past recordings on the SDGHI YouTube channel. Uh, so before I go into today, today's talk, um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is uh, Dr. Evelyn Wong, and I'm an Associate Consultant at the National Cancer Centre Singapore, as well as a Clinical Instructor with the Faculty at the SDGHI. Um, I would like to also then talk about the three seminar series that we'll be having. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we, we, we have a series of three talks lined up as part of the Global Health Seminar series on AI and Big Data. Um, Dr. Gavin will first um, kickstart the first session uh, today talking about um, his project in the screening of diabetic retinopathy and how AI has been used um, in that manner. Um, then we, uh, Prof. Melvin Chua from National Cancer Center will talk about Big Data and AI in Head and Neck Cancer um, Radiotherapy Planning. This will be happening next month. And to end off the series for 2023, we have two um, senior con uh, senior doctors from the Singh Health Institute talking about how they have actually used AI in their clinical practice um, in a calculation of osteoporotic score prediction, as well as um, through a spinal anesthesia delivery for women giving birth via CCR infection. Um, so without any um, further ado, I'd like to actually start this talk. But before that, just some quick housekeeping. Um, you'll be able to see a QA and a box on the Zoom bar. So please use that if you have any questions for our speaker today. Um, I also will be sharing the QR code. Um, next slide, please. At the end of the session, uh, where um, please uh, also uh, scan the QR code to fill up a short survey to help us with planning for future Global Health series. Um, so I'll go back to the first slide. Um, today's webinar is entitled AI for the Screening of Diabetic Retinopathy, and we're very excited to have Associate Professor um, Dr. Gavin Tan with us today. Uh, Dr. Tan is the Vice Chair for Strategy, Innovation, and Organizational Transformation, as well as the Head of the Ocular Diagnostic Department at the Singapore National Eye Centre. Dr. Tan was involved in the development and the implementation of a national diabetic retinopathy telemedicine screening program at Singapore, where AI was developed in diabetic retinopathy and translated to clinical use. His main research interest is diabetic eye disease and the eye as a window to diabetic complications. He has developed telemedicine virtual imaging uh, clinics, as well as various digital solutions to improve patient care. With that, I would like to hand over the time to Dr. Tan, please. Hi, hi everybody. Thanks, Evelyn, for the kind in, uh, introduction. Okay, let me just share my slides and then I'll start. Um, okay, so I'm Gavin and I'm from the National Eye Centre and the Singapore Eye Research Institute. So I'm going to little, talk a little bit about our experience with developing an AI, implementing it, and try a little bit to put a global health slant to this since that's the, the team of these uh, seminars. Um, obviously, I'm no global health expert, and I hope you'll be able to share knowledge and, and answer your queries and questions later. These are my financial disclosures and conflict of interest uh, declarations. So I, I'm going to assume that a lot of uh, people in this audience are not ophthalmologists, since it's not an ophthalmology seminar. So I'm just going to give a bit of background first. I think basically we know diabetes is a global emergency. Um, if you talk about pandemics in terms of how many people they kill, diabetes is really among the large ones. Uh, we know that there's going to be more than 400 million people with diabetes by 2030. And of those, we usually throw this estimate that one third, or in this case, about 130 to 40 million will suffer some form of eye damage. Okay. So the interesting thing about diabetes is it does uh, qualify in terms of a disease, at least for diabetic eye disease, that can be screened uh, where early detection results in an intervention that can prevent vision loss of blindness. So the issue here with diabetic eye disease is it tends to be asymptomatic in these early stages. And because it's asymptomatic, patients don't realize it until they get the end stages where they lose vision and the problem with the end stages is the 
vision loss tends to be irreversible. So what we have here is then an intervention point where if we screen the asymptomatic patients, we can pick up disease, make timely or appropriate referral, and result in early treatment that preserves the patient's vision. And this is particularly important in uh, diabetes because it tends to uh, affect um, younger patients or younger population. Uh, and so you end up with a potential population that if you don't detect and treat them early, will have vision loss uh, early when they're young, when they're still uh, productive and could have otherwise contributed to society. So because of that, there are screening guidelines uh, already available that suggest when screening is useful. And there is a difference in the screening guidelines between high resource uh, settings, which we would assume is like Singapore, and countries where they have low or medium resource or low or middle income countries where you can't afford to do things with such high intensity. And obviously with anything in life, it's about compromise. And the more frequently you screen, the more likely you are to pick up disease, but you can't afford to screen at such frequency or manage the overwhelming amount of referrals in most countries. So by reducing your frequency, you take the risk of missing a little bit of disease, but then you are able to provide a, a better quality of care for those that you actually do screen. So in the low resource setting, we're talking about longer screening intervals because you're willing to take a little bit more risk. So if screening is so effective and such a reasonable, sensible thing, thing to do, why isn't it done more for diabetic eye disease? And I think it's because of the scope of the problem and the fact that, again, that around the world, you have limited health budgets where they really can afford only to spend money on a limited number of things. And a lot of times, conditions which are asymptomatic uh, doesn't scream out to the population, doesn't win you votes, and it's not something that you would be naturally inclined to spend money on. And of course, you have a large population with disease. You don't have enough trained personnel or ophthalmologists. And of course, doing it annually is, is a burden. This is not a one-time opportunistic screening. So the very first basic concept that, that has enabled screening to be more um, effective or efficient is really telemedicine. So I'll talk a little bit about more telemedicine first uh, before we go into AI, because in our case, it really was one of the enablers. And in our telemedicine system here, or in fact, it's the model that was used uh, in many places in the world, and we didn't invent it. We did learn from the people mainly in, in the UK and in Northern Europe who had pioneered some of this work. Essentially, instead of examining the patient, you take a photograph, the photograph then gets transmitted to a central reading center and you get somebody to interpret the photos. Uh, in a lot of systems, you start with the ophthalmologist, but eventually you always want to filter the skill set down because you don't have enough ophthalmologists. And in our system, we train either optometrists or technicians to perform this interpretation. And with a result, these um, outcomes can be sent back to the screening center to primary care and some appropriate action is taken. And this was implemented in Singapore starting as a kind of like a HSDP project in 2010. And eventually they got funding to slowly expand nationally from 2015 to 18. And it's a telemedicine program on a customized platform. And within our public health system, I think the majority of patients will have screening done with a result sent back in the same day or within an hour. And of course, now you know with Healthier SG and the new KPIs, this has been expanded. There, there is a strong concerted attempt to extend this to every single diabetic in Singapore. So looking at our history, obviously, when we first started the system, we want to prove it's useful and effective. And this, we're using non-physician human graders, and we do have a, a, a grading accuracy that we have to report that shows good sensitivity and specificity. Again, when you implement anything from screening to an, anything you, you do real world, it's always good to show that something is cost-effective, and we did that within our screening program where we showed that an old model of opportunistic screening or screening where the doctors or family physicians had to do all the work uh, was less cost effective, obviously, because doctors are a bit more expensive than using our non-physician graders. And again, this kind of concept has also been applied and proven in other countries, in, in low and middle income countries as well. So it's not just useful in our developed country context. So the telemedicine screening gave us something cost effective, improved access, reduced burden on the physicians, and they did improve patient outcomes, uh, including adherence and diabetes-related uh, quality of life because they were being educated when they got screened. 
So it's still the, having telemedicine still doesn't address some of the challenges, which is the increasing workload from a growing diabetic uh, population. So I think AI in, in medicine really has come in, into focus or the forefront in the last, I would say, uh, eight to 10 years. And one of the major enablers has been the, the, the movement uh, to deep learning or convoluted uh, neural networks that allow you to get a better, much better efficacy or outcome um, by using larger and larger amounts of data. And this was really enabled because we started having better and better GPU and computing capacity. So the concept of using a convoluted neural network to solve problems, I think, was, was explored in the 70s and 80s, but it didn't really come into broader space use because the, the computers that could handle it were either too expensive, too difficult to build, or own, were only owned by perhaps uh, a very select few kind of organizations. But now, you know, you essentially have or what would have been a supercomputer 10 or 15 years ago in the pocket of, of your, in your palm with, with your new smartphones that all have GPU and some kind of deep learning capability. So because of that, we now have opportunity where we can make use of these large data set to uh, develop models or algorithms that have performance that's closer and closer to what the humans can do. And once you can do that, then obviously uh, you can use them to start to replace some of the work that we do. So AI and ophthalmology was really one of those low-hanging fruits, in particular when it comes to fundus imaging, because um, at the outset, the fundus imaging or the images that we take for diabetic retinal screening is a simple two-dimensional photograph, right? The same thing that you take with your, your in, in conceptually with your iPhone or your Android phone, and you know your Android phone, your iPhone can identify what these images are and allows you to do a search. So that same image or computer vision or capability was really, really easy adapt, to adapt to uh, fundus or diabetic retinopathy screening for these reasons. And there are various models in which you can uh, develop a kind of computer vision based CNN algorithms that will help you uh, identify, diagnose, predict, or basically uh, develop a, a probability score to answer a question for which you have adequate data for. Uh, this was some. This was uh, what I found was a very useful paper in trying to explain how it can be done to the lay person or lay physician. And that concept is not, is not difficult. You need a large amount of data. You need a good clinical question. You need to have good curated outcomes uh, from your data so that you can provide a truth or a ground truth with which to train your artificial intelligence algorithm. And there are actually increasingly many, many packages available, whether it's on a, a Python platform or increasingly there are idiot-proof platforms that are being developed so that clinicians and laypersons can use their data and, and have an outcome and train a model to predict that outcome. Um, I think the first paper that described using AI for deep diabetic retinopathy screening was from Google. And they, they established that using a uh, publicly available, uh, publicly available IPEX uh, database where diabetic retinopathy images were collected, they were able to develop a algorithm that could identify diabetic retinopathy in terms of referable disease with a very, very high uh, area under the curve. In our home system, we did the same kind of development. Why I mentioned the telemedicine earlier was because it became both the enabler in terms of providing us the data to train it, as well as the enabler in terms of providing the infrastructure to implement the AI back. So a lot of times not having an infrastructure is one of the major barriers to implementing uh, AI because you can easily develop an algorithm, but if you can't make it talk to your doctor, your patient, your EMR, your EHR, then it's not really going to work. So in here we use, um, there were a total of 500,000 images in this data set. Of course, the proportion was used for training, about 70,000 uh, for, for the training of diabetic retinopathy. And again, we developed a, a algorithm that could identify disease in the images with a high AUC. I'm not going to go so much into technical architecture, but essentially we provided images and a ground truth. So I think those are the most important things that you need to understand. You need a good, well-curated ground truth because the machine is only going to be able to develop an algorithm as good as the ground truth data that was provided for training. 
And that has some further implications later on when we talk about some application in the settings which is outside of a developed country like Singapore. So the ground truth here was provided by our graders who had a significant amount of training and there was arbitration uh, by uh, medical professionals as well when, they, when the graders disagreed. And we found that uh, using this data, the algorithm was able to evaluate the same category of images from our own screening program with good sensitivity and specificity. And we found the particular benefit was the sensitivity in the worst forms of disease, where they were more, more like, less likely to miss pathology than humans because machines are pretty, can be pretty reproducible and infallible in that sense. Um, and again, this is the, the AOTC curve that I showed earlier. And we, of course, wanted to ask a few questions when we evaluated the AI, whether there would be certain groups that did better or worse when we applied it. And that, again, has implications when you want to implement this into the real world. And in our population, there was some variation according to ethnicity in our validation study, but it pretty much pre um, performed it with pre pretty good consistency and meeting some form of minimum standard. And this was irrespective whether you were looking at the mild form of disease or the more severe form of disease. Uh, we also validated in, in these are the AUCs for the validation in the different ethnic groups. And we also validated it in external uh, cohorts in order to ensure that it can be applied in contexts outside of Singapore. And that include, included studies uh, from America and African Americans, uh, from uh, Latinos from Mexico, as well as, as uh, Caucasian populations from Australia. We also looked at the performance across different kinds of cameras that again has implications later when we de de describe the implementation in the real world. And the limitation here is the cameras that we use were generally these tabletop cameras. Most of these populations, although they were very, were done in very controlled kind of environment and setting. And I will go through why that is important later on. We also wanted to establish whether the algorithm was actually identifying a pathology that was plausible and consistent with what we were done as humans. So this is a, a heat map that shows a probability where the algorithm is identifying from the image that contributes to the probability of disease. And you can see the green areas were cons uh, corresponding to the pathology that a human would have identified if they had looked at the pa paper patients manually. And since our program also had opportunistic screening for AMD, age-related macular degeneration and glaucoma dissuspect, we did the same uh, process and training for these two outcomes and we found it to be fairly reliable and reproducible for the specific outcome for which it was trained. The next thing you want to do once you have an artificial intelligence algorithm, of course, is to figure out how to use it. Because something is great in, in your lab or to print or publish a paper, but it's of no use to, to me and yourself if, if it doesn't help uh, the population or the patients. So when we wanted to integrate, there were certain things that we, we had as set out as objectives. We wanted to ensure that the outcomes and screening accuracy ended up similar to the existing program. We wanted to have some kind of uh, proof that it would reduce manpower required for screening, if not, there's no benefit implementing the AI. And of course, we wanted to look at global healthcare cost savings. Uh, the implementation process was not uh, straightforward. Uh, we did have to uh, get HSA approval as a medical uh, device. And we also learned through this process that that's not something an academic institution could do easily. So eventually the uh, licensing for the algorithm was, was spun off into a startup company. And the startup company did all the kind of compliance and regulatory things in order to enter the medical device into the Singapore regulatory system. And then we, after that, we had to navigate all the IT um, related issues that, that I'm, I'm sure anybody who works in Singapore healthcare would understand uh, can be challenging in order to ensure that this algorithm was put into our public health system. And actually from our experience, I think the, the barriers and the bars to implementing an AI algorithm into our public health system in Singapore has really been lowered because we, basically found out the problems, fed the problems back to um, the administrators and the people who had control over this and they have, and I have to commend them at least for making a lot of efforts to bring the bar down for future efforts. And now we have things like an AI imaging based uh, 
collaborative uh, platform that has been put up for radiology and other diseases as well. As well as even in Sing Health, there's a supercomputer setup that has been recently implemented in order to enable everybody else on campus to do things like this. But in our initial implementation, what we wanted to do was to evaluate how effective the AI was in a real world study. And also to decide which model of implementation is best. You can use AI in many uh, forms. You can use it completely automated, taking a human completely out of the loop and making a, a end decision straight away. Uh, but or you could use it as a stay, uh, as a completely as a physician assistant or as a human assistant where you use the AI, but the human still reviews every single image or makes every single final decision. Uh, but here we decided to do the first and the latter, which was a hybrid model where we would then use the AI as the first stage and use human graders to arbitrate only the abnormals or do audits on the normals to ensure a quality of care was not compromised. So we wanted to evaluate these few models, whether a fully automated versus fully human versus a hybrid model will be useful. And there were some reasons why a hybrid model we felt would still be important in our system. Uh, among them being that the AI could not de define and identify all forms of disease. The AI was good at telling us, at least at that point, whether disease that required further management was present or not. But the ability to nail down the severity uh, uh, with a high level of confidence was, was still not available at that point of time. And the severity did make a difference to how we decided to prioritize referrals. As you know, in Singapore, the, the public health sector does have a demand problem. And when you have a demand problem, you always need to prioritize triage, severity, and urgency or review in order to make sure you still have the best outcomes. So what we found in our study compared to gold standard was the AI performed well. Uh, it was probably a little bit better in sensitivity overall, a lot better in sensitivity for the worst outcomes. So those patients who had the highest risk of losing vision, but it suffered a little bit in specificity in the real world data sets in compared to our lab-based uh, validation studies. And so again, once you notice this, then you know having a second stage where a review of um, positives were made would help you rule out these false positives and improve specificity. And so when we actually looked at the various models, we found that the hybrid model uh, would give you a high sensitivity and allow you to improve the specificity uh, that the AI uh, would have sacrificed if we had gone with a purely autonomous model. And of course, once you've looked at these various uh, outcomes, you want to really do economic modeling uh, analysis. Uh, a model could be better, but if it's a many, many, many times more costly and then it may still may not be what you want to choose as your implementation. And we did, our economic modeling was concurrent with the overall best outcomes. And it found that the two-tier model was actually better because it did improve specificity and reduce the false positive rate, which means that you ended up with less unnecessary referrals to tertiary care or the specialist outpatient clinics. And we know special outpatient clinics are an expensive resource to maintain. So if you can reduce referrals there, you reduce costs. There were also other benefits that would have that was not modeled that would have including included that would include reducing the competing demands for patients with real disease, which I think is very important when you start screening. Because if you screen with a high false positive rate, you may more pick up more disease. But if all these disease patients can no longer get access to care because false positives are flooding your healthcare system, then you actually do not provide benefit. We also looked at the impact that the, the screening had on other conditions because this algorithm obviously was not meant to detect everything under the sun, although now more algorithms are available that can do that. And But of course, in, uh, we also learned that today, if you build a new algorithm, it's slightly better than this. You can't implement it straight away because you got need to go through the whole regulatory process in order to get it approved for use. We did find that for most of the threatening, vision threatening conditions, the AI still detected abnormalities and that's because they, it was looking for um, features of normal and gradable uh, looking at when it compared or it analyzed the images. So a lot of the disease or uh, pathological processes that had uh, imaging features that were similar to diabetic retinopathy would have been picked up and referred anyway. So the challenges that we learned according to this implementation is that you, you need a really high sensitivity, especially for your worst form of disease where missing it would have medical, legal and, 
and morbidity consequences. Uh, you still need a high specificity because overwhelming the system with false positive uh, raffles would be bad. Uh, the reality is uh, at the moment still AIs really are not designed to screen for all conditions. And it's actually very hard to get regulatory approval for an AI that can screen for every single uh, condition. The barrier would be much higher. And we had to navigate things like condition acceptance, variation of performance uh, across different uh, settings, as well as, as being sure that we audited variation of performance over time. So a lot of this had to be worked through our startup and that startup really has been quite successful in trying to navigate regulation. And interestingly, that startup has, uh, besides Singapore and getting a CE mark, has focused a lot on developing countries because we, they felt that that was a niche that was unfilled by the larger companies that had, uh, had, had um, uh, been funded or, or developed in places like the United States where really the only ones that could concern themselves with the uh, high value first world uh, opportunities. So um, our algorithm has been approved in a lot of uh, countries and you see a lot of them would be considered a low and middle income countries rather than just developing countries. And they have engaged uh, various uh, groups, camera manufacturers and all that to try it and solve those issues. So we take so we've developed an AI, we've implemented our system, but how does this apply outside of Singapore, which, you know, people like to say Singapore is, is a test bed that allows you to enter Asia as a market. But really, Singapore is not like the rest of Asia as a market. Singapore is highly developed. Singapore does not have geographical barriers. Singapore is a highly uh, educated and connected population. So in low and middle income countries, things are very, very uh, different. I think right now, most are very limited. Or in fact, no access to diabetic retinopathy screening services at all. Uh, but the reality is increasingly diabetes is a disease of the developing world. So in developed countries, there's increased focus and, and, and affluence that allows us to tackle things like uh, nutrition and obesity. Whereas in the rapidly developing countries, what you've had is the change of lifestyle for maybe an agrarian uh, uh, economy to one that's, that's de developing industry. And industry means that they also start to have access to lots of low, cheap, uh, calorific value of foods, essentially junk food, which results in obesity. And obesity leads to a diabetic uh, epidemic. And then the major barrier, of course, is the lack of funding and trained staff in a lot of uh, low and middle income countries. Um, and if you take uh, Africa as an example, it's going to see the largest proportionate increase in the number of people living with diabetic eye disease uh, by 2045, by an increase of 143%. But in, in Africa, there's only 2.5 ophthalmologists per million and against a global average of about 37.5. I think in Singapore is about 45. Uh, and in fact, in Singapore, we do use a lot of um, allied health or paramedical staff to assist and uh, uh, augment our, our physicians. Whereas in these countries, besides having not enough physicians, they don't have infrastructure to train all these other personnel as well. So we have had a little bit of experience, don't claim to be experts, but we did do uh, some evaluation, for example, in, in Zambia, because we wanted to see how this would perform basically in an ethnic group that we really didn't train on and in conditions which will be were quite different from Singapore because, the, I mean, the startup did have ambitions to explore uh, developing countries as a potential uh, market base. And this screening cohort was uh, the community eye service program provided by the Kitwe Hospital in Zambia and patients were identified either through diabetes or pharmacy registries and were invited for screening uh, either through billboard advertising, radio, TV broadcasts or in, in their community to church congregations. And in this particular instance, they did take dilated fundus photographs with a di diabetic retinopathy system camera. So that's a quite a uh, reasonably high-end camera. So in terms of a camera setup, they're not too much different from what we would have done in Singapore and they did dilated imaging. So although it, is when it was in a third world mobile setting and in a different ethnic group, they did find that the performance of our artificial intelligence was actually still pretty good in this particular data set. And again, it was identifying the correct kinds of uh, disease processes. Uh, when we looked at uh, those, those images, uh, and the AUCs were, were good and comparable, above 90% good sensitivity and specificity. 
But again, in third world countries and the real world, we are not always going to have these higher end kind of uh, larger devices, uh, an ability to perform um, dilation in a, in a systematic widespread fashion. And so instead, the challenge will be a lot more mobile devices. They're cheap, they're portable, they can do their job. But obviously, there will be a difference in the quality of imaging, although they are rapidly improving. But these then really expand your ability to um, translate or upskill your provision of care in uh, low to middle income countries. And obviously, the potential is that um, with the rapid uh, development of 4G infrastructure, even in developing countries, you can you can transmit data over the um, over the telecommunication system. Or in fact, if you know smartphones increasingly have GPUs and you can install the AI as an application on these devices. So what we did find, and this was an application of an earlier algorithm, uh, which uh, Zeiss actually had licensed for us. And again, Zeiss implemented it themselves. There were a lot of limitations in how they implemented, which uh, why would I have done if, 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 if I were in charge? But again, I was not. And But it what is a great example of how if you don't apply your algorithm right, it's not going to perform as well as you want it to. So what they did was Zeiss had a mobile camera network they had set up in India. Uh, they were participating in house-to-house -house cross sectional studies in various reasons where they sent uh, very basically trained field workers to take images uh, in that kind of setting without dilation, less than ideal, um, less than ideal training, equipment, environment, etc. They took multiple images, but when they implemented this for, for various reasons, they only decided to use one image for, for, for the AI to interpret. Humans were allowed to use all the images that were taken. We generally use two images per eye in, in our own system in Singapore. So you already hamstring the system with all these conditions. They did find the overall sensitivity for gradability was still very good, 90%. Specificity did suffer a lot, this coming down to 60%. For overall detection of referral disease, there was a drop in sensitivity to as low as 70%. But a lot of these could be related to the poor ungradable images, where specificity still performed well at 85%. And we are talking about this. If you show this to me, I'm not going to be able to grade it. And it's not surprising that the AI was, was not able to either. Um, because multiple images were taken per eye, as many as they felt necessary, and the humans were allowed to see all the images, it would have been plausible that the humans could have made a better decision by piecing together little bits of information from all the multiple images to come to an eventual conclusion. So from what we really learned from this is that uh, how you train your AI is applicable to how you apply it because if the conditions change in the field, there will be a degradation in, uh, in performance here with the field workers, the handheld cameras, the single image use only, no dilation, etc. There's further clinical trials that are being kind of collaborated with that really is looking at, at more questions when you talk about applying uh, AI for DR screening in, in the third world. And this is by a, a group, um, uh, Charles is working with the, uh, I think they've, they've got a research version of the uh, algorithm from the startup and they're trying to do a randomized clinical trial to look at applying the Selena AI in Tanzania, and where their hypothesis is, it's it's going to be better for two reasons. Firstly, they really have a lack of trained staff, so the level of their training for for large screening purposes tends to be a low level of, of staff skill set. And at the same time, the skill set and grading system uh, has a, a loop that that doesn't give the patients any information until two to three weeks later. Uh, and that can result in loss of interest and lower compliance. In fact, in their original screening system, which was human-based, they found follow-up rates as low as 40%. So more than half their patients they identified that had problems never went to see the doctor and would have lost vision anyway. So they hypothesized that by giving a, a more accurate uh, outcome as well as an immediate outcome that people can take action on, they would see better patient center outcomes in terms of referral and intervention for disease compared to their standard of care. And actually that whole concept of, of using uh, 
uh, rapid assessment and then providing for rapid feedback and improving outcomes has been shown in one other um, much uh, smaller clinical trial, which only had 800 participants. That other trial in Tanzania is aiming for, I think, almost 3,000 to be adequately powered statistically. But in this study, they found that uh, looking at 800 participants, of which 275 were referred based on AI screening and either randomized to um, the normal intervention, which is the immediate feedback and counseling compared with the standard of care where they were only informed of results uh, much later after the initial screening. They did find that the whole AI supported immediate uh, feedback loop resulted in a much higher referral uh, adherence. So there are benefits to having AI, which gives you a faster result as well, other than just reducing your cost. And of course, then your question to me is, if it's so difficult to examine these images uh, in, on these handheld in, uh, cameras, why don't you just train on it? Obviously, in Singapore, I don't have direct access to a large a number of, of, of handheld uh, camera images because we don't have that kind of system here. We have the luxury of not having it. But um, my friends and colleagues in India from the various institutes they have, and they have then used this data to train their AI. And obviously, their AI trained in this particular setting performed better in this particular setting uh, in terms of detecting eye disease. So that's a very important lesson about the specificity of your data set and your training when it comes to artificial intelligence. Uh, you can do things to generalize it, but obviously there will always be some limitations when you change the application setting from the training and development setting. And it did, they were able to identify severity of disease even in some images where quality was poorer than we would have expected. Um, at the same time, you really want to look at the cost effectiveness of applying this AI in, in, in these real world data in, in kind of like third world costing. And this, interestingly, what this uh, China paper found was that if you looked at the incremental cost effectiveness of AI, it, it might have a, a higher quality uh, or a good quality per person compared to a manual grading system. But because their labor cost in, in China was uh, assumed to be cheaper, and uh, they didn't assume that was any improvement in compliance by applying AI, they actually did find that it was it did increase cost effectiveness. However, if they had assumed that there would be a 7% increase in, in, in a, a compliance to grading, and that's not unexpected. You saw that earlier paper where they saw a 30 percent, 30 plus percent improvement in compliance, or if the cost of screening with the AI reduced by 50%, and again, we know that AI has, has some uh, hidden costs in terms of applying technology, but we know the cost of applying technology will decrease in time, then they found that AI would be a dominant strategy over a 30-year model. So if you look at how much screening has actually been done in low and middle income countries or studies published on it, and we'll find that really it's dominated by India and China because in spite of their areas of low poverty, India and China do have population centers or academic and medical centers with a high access to technology. And really there's still a lot of limited data set that comes out of places like Africa, and South America. And the concern obviously is you end up with low and middle income countries becoming what they, we call health data poor and not benefiting from the health data, a revolution that we would expect. So that's a problem that needs to be addressed. At the same time, what we really feel is that AI can be used as a multiplier effect where if you only have one or two doctors for a million population, using an AI to remove the most menial task can be a, a, a force multiplier for your physicians, and that will allow you to do more with less. So it's going to be a really important part of, of uh, care that's going to be translated in low to middle income countries where they can't afford personalized care from a physician all the time. Uh, we looked, we saw the impact of immediate uh, referral and counseling that can be enabled by AI. And in fact, one interesting thing I'm not going to talk about here, but we are increasing the various groups in Sing Health as well as trying to look at is how AI can be used to help this counseling and, and referral direction better and more. And we now know that we have, have access to large language models. I'm sure a lot of you out there have tried a chat GPT. And, and you, you can imagine if that chat service can be used to provide information for patients, you could actually then re reduce manpower even further and provide that kind of counseling that will improve compliance and adherence that's important to your outcome. 
Uh, we've done a small study that's uh, still in, in preparation where we looked at chat GPT uh, generated patient education material for diabetic retinopathy and nephropathy. And we asked patients uh, to evaluate this material and physicians to evaluate this material and compared it with what we had in standard of care. And the evaluation did find there was no statistically significant difference in the quality of the material perceived by either the patient, the patient or the physician. So there is a possibility, at least for the lay person, you could provide education material quite easily and cheaply with AI LLM based tools. And again, there will still be a lot of barriers to successful implementation. There's still going to be lack of screening sites. AI is not going to make a screening site appear and AI is not going to make a camera appear. So you still need uh, infrastructure and funding to do that. Um, there is, if you really look at India and, and, and China, they have a high mobile phone penetration, but places like Africa do not. So you still need uh, to figure out telecommunication issues or device-based algorithms. Obviously, as you can see, we had demonstrated in the worst possible conditions, you will definitely see a decrease in performance. And you may need to train AI on these uh, basically poor uh, country conditions in order to ensure that you don't come, end up with healthcare or health data poverty uh, interfering with the efficacy of AI. And again, creating a referral does not result in the outcomes. You need the rest of the back end to ensure that there's, there's still treatment being affected. If not, you're not you're going to screen with no loss or reduction in visual loss if they're not seeing the doctor getting the right care at the end of the day. So where do we go from here? Again, AI is going to be used to diagnose more and more diseases in ophthalmology. Um, and of course, we need to have better and better experience in terms of delivering the AI from, from kind of a lab-based system into clinical application. Just a little bit of what else we are hoping AI can do and where it may even be more advantageous in low and medium uh, countries is, is the data we, can, we get from AI is not just going to be able to predict diabetic retinopathy. We're trying to use this data to predict progression, so future outcomes, not just present outcomes. We're trying to use the fundus images to predict uh, the outcomes that would have required right now an OCT scan, which is kind of like a three-dimensional uh, CT scan type, but using light instead of radiation to diagnose certain other diseases. And we find that it can be uh, similarly almost effective, although not as effective as that kind of high-definition cross-sectional scanning. We're also trying to use AI to identify systemic diseases and it can do various things from estimating uh, risk factors from, from uh, fundus photographs in terms of looking at uh, whether you'd have cardiovascular disease, blood pressure, et cetera, or looking at uh, identifying established biomarkers for disease from the fundus images as, itself, because uh, the old axiom of uh, the eyes being the window of a soul is not inaccurate. You can look at neurovascular changes that occur in the rest of the body from the appearance of the fundus photo and this a study from, from one of my ex-colleagues did, uh, that did prove that uh, you could pr predict um, cardiovascular risk similar to a CT calcium score just with a fundus image. And these are other works with other colleagues that have tried to establish that same concept. And taking one thing, one thing further, my other colleague has, has tried to establish how we can use the fundus screening photographs to identify diabetic kidney disease or kidney disease in, in general and in the future, obviously, to predict whether you develop this disease. So really where we feel AI in, in terms of ophthalmology or diabetic uh, eye screening in the future is, is not just to identify diabetic eye disease, but it becomes a huge potential for opportunistic screening in low and middle income countries or a lot of other things. And of course, that the startup that, that we mentioned is trying to explore whether if they set up that hardware to capture these images and that software platform to interpret these images, really the longer term benefits are going to be a lot broader because this can be then leveraged to detect other diseases. And you may say, why detect kidney disease in from a fundus photograph in Singapore when you can get a EGFR or a urine albumin creatinine ratio easily in the polyclinic Singapore? Well, maybe there's no application in Singapore, but in a low and medium income country where they can't send the lab facility out into the villages, then a portable camera that you can bring out in, into that kind of field condition will really be a boon uh, or an advantage in those conditions. So in summary, artificial intelligence is going to improve the cost effectiveness and capacity of screening. 
uh, both in developed and low and middle income countries. There are a lot of challenges that remain. There's still limited uh, amount of data uh, in terms of real world evidence in low and medium uh, income countries and even the data in low and medium income country conditions or training algorithms. Algorithms still don't replicate full complexity of multifactorial human diagnosis and decision making, but I think that that bar is coming closer and closer. And AI only solves one part of any medical problem. Uh, it solves one part of a decision making or inter image interpretation or in here in terms of interpreting the image and screening. You still need the infrastructure to do the rest of the front end and back end in order to make an in impact on the patient's lives. But I think the future is still bright. I think where we, we see a lot of interest is the large language models that can further improve the human part of, of the, whether it's counseling, boosting compliance, boosting education, et cetera. I think AI will in future provide more and more insight into not just diagnosing disease, but predicting progression or, or, or prognostication. And of course, AI, in, in, as we see in our application, may in future have the ability to identify other systemic diseases just from retinal photographs in a very scalable and low cost manner. And of course, I'd like to acknowledge all the many, many people in the various teams in NUS, in SARI, in SNEC, and global collaborators that have contributed to some data I've presented here. And if you're interested in, in ophthalmology, well, we have a meeting uh, uh, in January next year that will discuss, among other things, AI in ophthalmology and beyond. And with that, I thank you very, very much. I think we have a little bit of time for questions and answers. Thank you so much, Gavin. I think that's a great um, case study on what AI can do, especially from um, the case study of that of ophthalmology and more importantly, how the implementation it is in uh, the low to middle income countries. And I remind myself that you've been spending like decades just actually doing it. So it looks huge. I mean, the amount of uh, effort that you put into with your team um, and, and, and it's a whole um, you know, spectrum from the point of when these language models are actually developed to the point of implementation and subsequently to um, regional as well as international sort of application. Um, I think we do have quite a lot of questions on the Q&A, so I, I'm just going to go dive straight to it. So um, there are two questions on, on the technology itself, so we'll address that first. Um, somebody actually asked, was did the AI model develop from scratch or was it an existing deep learning model fine-tuned to adapt for retinal screening? Perhaps you would take that so, question first. So again, I don't think anybody develops anything absolutely from scratch anymore. I mean, you use existing models that has ImageNet or et cetera training as your base and then you train it for a specific task. And we know there are a lot that are available from VGG 16, 19, ResNet, Inception, and I think there's there's some differences in performance, but most of the modern kind of uh, baseline algorithms, uh, CNNs for computer visions work pretty well. I think we had, the, our group had one paper where they compared the performance using various uh, L, base, base algorithms in order to train. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the technical piece, but I think at this point of time, uh, you don't need to build every, anything from scratch. Uh, there are packages available out there for you to apply to your data set. And maybe just going down that question, I mean, say for example, if somebody in this group has an, uh, you know, inspired by your talk and is in a different sort of, um, of clinical practice, um, say oncology, all right, and all of a sudden we want to do something that's also using this, how would you actually um, encourage the person to start? Like, where do you, where do you even start? I think, I think the first thing you need to do is you have to have, like anything else, right? You need a good clinical question. You need a relevant clinical question. If you ask a stupid question, you'll get a silly answer. Then the next thing you need to do is find out what kind of data you can put together because uh, our AI algorithms are still quite data hungry and find the best way to make sure your data is as large and as clean as possible. And then obviously there are various ways you can do it about it. You can take a course uh, on deep learning. Uh, we, there were a few that Duke organized previously, which actually broke it down into to similar. You, it's still quite Python dependent, but it's something that you could probably try and do yourself. But in, in reality, trying to do yourself is great for a paper, but when you want something that's going to be production ready, you probably need to work with, with a group that has a little bit more technical expertise. We do have some of that in Sing Health now. Daniel's group uh, at the cluster level do have some data scientists, but a lot of our work as well is with collaborations, whether it's with ASTAR or School of Computing in NUS and elsewhere. So so look for collaborators will be the other and, and look for where your academic institution has other resources. 
Great. And um, so I'm going to just ask this question. The AI speeds up the diagnostic process as well as uncover more patients who need treatment. Is there adequate clinical expertise to cope with the greater patient load? So uh, that's, that's, that's the, the, the same, the age-old question, right, with, with regards to screening. If you want to screen, you need to figure out how to manage these patients downstream. If not, it will not be beneficial. I think in Singapore, that's a little bit easier to address. But if you've seen publicity about waiting times, you know it's still not. And in a way, that's why um, we, we felt that having information and, and having that second line that allowed us to try out severity was important because then you can provide recommendations. And there will be AIs that do that as good as humans in the future. Uh, how urgent the, the referrals are going to be, whether it needs to be something that's a, a kind of casual three to six months follow-up versus somebody who needs to get seen through or, um, our rapid access or early access pathways. So so that, that, is, that is a question that your healthcare system needs to deal with. So it's AI does not solve that part of the equation. Uh, and, and maybe before I take the next question on the regulatory challenges, perhaps um, leading on to this question, uh, when you actually uh, implement these sort of technologies and screenings in other countries, in other low middle income countries, say for example, in the African experience that you have, how does that actually, um, you know, um, I mean, what are some of the challenges that you face? Is it the training part? Is it the manpower part? Is it the, um, getting the hospitals together in order to, you know, continue on? What are the challenges that you I think face there, there are a lot of components. Firstly, it's whether they even have screening programs present or not. If they don't, then I think either very challenging, good luck to you, or you need advocacy. So I think the good thing about that startup is because obviously they're commercially minded. They are actually doing advocacy in some of these countries where, which don't have screening programs where they go to governments to tell them, this is data that shows it may be cost effective. You want to consider supporting it because if there's no support, it doesn't happen. In countries that already have some infrastructure, then it is finding somebody who will want to champion it. Uh, and then deciding what kind of regular ap approval. Again, I'm not really in charge of uh, uh, overseas implementation. Most of the work that we've done is research collaboration. So it then becomes a research collaborator that sees value in it and is willing to put in the extra effort to see how it can be implemented. But usually they, they are quite keen because they, they are very aware of the limitations they have there, which is no capacity to interpret images. You can have one ophthalmologist serving literally a million people, right? So there's no capacity to do anything uh, more. So when they do see it as, a, as an opportunity. And then you need to figure out all the technical issues in terms of can the algorithm be run in that country? Do they have the infrastructure to do it, etc. But again, the startup being incentivized to, to uh, provide something that can be accessible, will obviously be trying to work with the camera manufacturers to just put it straight on the camera or working uh, applications that can be done on, on casual computing rather than requiring a high-end cloud uh, system to run. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, after all, the most important thing is really the partnership and the collaborative effort. With Correct. I mean, yeah. it, at the end of the day, people still make things happen. Yeah. AI yeah. is an enabler, but people still make things happen. Okay. And... I know we are just in time. Last question. Can you elaborate on some of the regulatory challenges that you face locally? I'm sure a lot of people have that question. So, so I, I think um, well, that's, that's complicated. We, again, we didn't deal with that ourselves, but um, it goes back to software as a medical device. Uh, in order to, to uh, meet the software as a medical device uh, in any regulatory pathway, usually you require processes. Software requires processes to ensure your software is consistent, so on and so forth. And that usually requires ISO. That's not something that we could have done. The ISO for software as a medical device, we could not have done, for example, for SNC. It's just not practical. Um, then once you get all those regulatory requirements, then it's providing documentation. I mean, again, you've been involved in pharma trials, I'm sure. You do the study, somebody else does the documentation. Trying to do the documentation yourself, uh, even with um, kind of the regulatory uh, people brought in was again, something we had no experience with. And it's difficult to do from an academic uh, setting because you need the right expertise, the right time commitment to deal with all that um, paperwork that's required. Then of course, it's then negotiating and figuring out from the regulator, what is the bar or, or level of evidence that you need to provide to to meet to meet your uh, claim. Obviously, if you're claiming 
if you're claiming to cure cancer with AI, for example, then your bar is going to be much higher than you're claiming to help the, the radiologist identify uh, early tumors on a mammogram more effectively. You need, you need a different bar and you would have to then figure out what kind of uh, research studies you would need to prove that bar. Again, depending on the indication, the level of evidence is going to be different. Uh, and then after putting all together, then it's preparing the submission documents. You'll be amazed how much submission documents uh, they, that, that is required to go through a regulatory process. There are reams and reams of, of pretty much a lot of repetitive dry things, but that's just the way it works. And a lot of uh, simple technical details like this part of the software communicates with what other part of it all have to be documented when the software is a medical device. So those are that's that's that whole process. Lah. I think... Uh, HSA also is, in a way, very supportive and generous. And, and so um, I think that they have, they are re really willing to communicate with, with the applicants on, on what's needed and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, thank you very much, Gavin, for your time. And I am aware that it's now 11.31, so we're right on time. We've ended in time. Um, so um, um, thank you everyone for attending these talks and like I said we're doing a whole series on it so we're going to talk not just about diagnosis about treatment and subsequently in the um, talks that's featuring in October and November we will be talking a little bit about AI in the use of treatment of other sort of uh, chronic disease as well um, Glenn has now just flashed the QR code um, before we leave and we depart with the rest I hope this Friday session has been inspiring for every one of you and do um, scan the QR code and let us know about how you want us to plan these future global health seminar series. Uh, so once again, I'd like to thank the opportunity. Thank you very much, Gavin, for coming here today. Um, thank you everyone for attending as well. Yep, thanks for the invitation. And, and I think I, I look forward to see what other people have been doing in this aspect as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, that's great. Thank you, everybody. Um, I will just leave the QR code here. Um, if there's any other future questions, um, I'm sure Gavin would be happy to answer anything pers personally. You can approach him directly. Okay, thank you everybody, thank you.